yeah, I will speak about both volumes of polytopes <coughs> and the number of lattice points varying and some algebraic and combinatorial structures that uh, are connected with these, these quantities. This brief outline. Essentially, I will start with some very basic <coughs> examples and then things will gradually become more difficult. Uh, so here is the first example. Suppose you have a bunch of two and three cent coins. You want to pay me uh, 10 cents in how many different ways can you do this? Okay, I guess everyone has figured this out that there are two different ways of doing this. Namely, you can give me uh, 2 times 3 cent and 2 times 2 or 5 plus 2. And uh, well, this is a very classical problem called Corbenius's coin exchange problem, which was studied in the 19th century by great people. And yeah, let's look at this in more detail. So first of all, we want to let's replace the 10 by an n, and then we finding the answer to this question is the same as uh, we're solving this linear like, sometime equation 2a plus 3 b equals n. And uh, geometrically, <coughs> this corresponds to finding integer points in this polytope, and then going back to the case n equals 10, we can draw the polytope here, and we see that there are two integer points contained in it, which are the two solutions, which would be like 2, that I zero, this would be 2, 2. And then of course one can look at other values of n, and this corresponds to kind of shifting the polytope out a bit, and then if n grows, the number of integer points becomes bigger. And um, yeah, now let's look at these uh, polytopes in more detail. So we can look at their normalized volume. So we want to like normalize the volume such that the distance between, uh, well, the volume of such an kind of interval between two lattice points is one. So this would mean that this polytope has volume three, and then we can see uh, that the volume of the parameter polytope depending on it is n over six. And uh, well, the number of formula or the number of integer points is slightly more difficult. So we also have to start n over six here, and then some linear terms, and then some kind of uh, constant terms which vary depending on which coset modulo n we are in. So we need this one depends on whether n is even or odd, and this is a certain root of unity. And then of course you can ask what is the relationship between the volume and the number of integer points in this polytope? And uh, what, one obvious remark, uh, answer is that uh, they are roughly the same, the leading error is equal. And, uh, well, then there's also a more complicated answer, namely you can apply this very complicated differential operator to the volume measuring function and get get by. And I will explain to you later how one gets this, this plot operator. And what you, again, you see this one gives us the other PPN over C. This one, and so on. Um, okay, <laughs> now we have kind of looked at one dimensional problems. Now let's do something more interesting. So, suppose we have a vector uv in a two dimensional lattice, and we are given a set of vectors here 1, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 1. And again, we want to write some vector uv at the sum for those three vectors. So of course, what the vector uv should lie in the cones and the three vectors, otherwise we can't write it at the sum of those vectors. And again, there is some kind of geometric way of looking at this. We look at all the points of all the a, b, c, and all of the forms. A times the first vector plus two times the second vector plus c times the 
and the search vectors like the UV that we are looking for, and then the UV is five two, so we get this polygon. So well, there are three variables, and two equations have to be satisfied, so our solution set is one dimensional that contains like, the three integer points. Okay. <coughs> Now, yeah, just the same polytope again. And now let's start introducing our notation. So this function i will always count integer points in the polytope. And this function t will measure the normalized volume of this uh, variable polytope. And yes. Then we can kind of draw these functions and when we see that well, the number of integer points is always the minimum of e plus 1 and d plus 1 if you would be lying in this course of course and, and the volume is the minimum of u and b if we are in the output process and here we can kind of see we subdivide the positive portion into two codes and on each of these two cones, our function agrees with the linear polynomial, and the same here, except that the linear polynomials are slightly different. So we see volume, the number of integer points. And again, we can ask how can we like transform this into that one? And again, there is some differential operator, one plus differentiating in direction u plus differentiating in direction b gives us what terms u to u plus 1 and u to b plus 1. And where well, there's a tiny problem, namely, well, this is, this is a piecewise polynomial function, and uh, so it's not always, not everywhere smooth, namely on this dash red line, depending if you uh, like take a limit from this side or from that side, we get different values. So this is, you know, doesn't work everywhere. That was what we can always do, uh, kind of do some shift to transform one function to the other. And this is for the special case of something we will <coughs> see later on. Okay, this was the end of the introduction. And yeah, now we can slowly start with some definitions. So the setup for today is that x is always a list of vectors, n vectors, in a d-dimensional lattice, or it's presumably a n matrix where the vectors are the columns. And uh, we suppose assume that there are more columns than rows, and that the matrix has full rank. And we want to all the vectors to live on one side of of a hyperplane, because the origin is not the only convection of the vector, so we can put vectors on one side of a hyperplane. The vector like this. Um, yeah, sometimes it, uh, we will have a list of vectors which is unimodular, meaning that every non singular d by d sub matrix has determined one plus or minus one, or equivalently if we choose a vector space basis from our list of vectors then it will already be a vector spaces and well, this matrix is unimodular, this one is not. We well, we saw in the example here the vector position function of polynomial here we have these periodic parts. Uh, let me go to X. It's, uh, The rest of the talk. And okay, now well, we have seen these variable polygons before. So we have a kind of we have a parameter u living in R to the D, and then we look at all the alpha in the positive portion of R to the N such that x times alpha is u. Give us an example of this. 
And now we define these three functions. So we have the multivariate spline, which measures the normalized volume of these polygons. We have the box spline, which measures the normalized volume of some kind of the intersection of the polygon with the unit cube. And we have a the vector position function, which counts the number of integer points in the polygon. of this function, so the, the box line is supported, and the multivariate line is supported on the cone spanned by the vectors, and it's a piecewise polynomial function of degree n minus e, and the regions of polynomiality are also cones spanned by some sublist of series x. And what well, the vector position function is only defined on a lattice, and it's piecewise quasi polynomial, which means that we can choose a sub, -la sub lattice of the integer lattice, and then on each coset of the sub lattice it agrees to a polynomial. And what well, is the matrix is nice, it's really modular, then this is already a piecewise polynomial function. And here's another example. So the box line is on the right, which has always compact support, which is part of the zonal tools you find by the list. And it kind of, in the first part, it agrees with the multivariate spline, which will then continue to go. And the vector partition function is kind of similar when we have this periodic curve, which goes up and down. And here's just another example. A two-dimensional example with four vectors. So four minus two is two. So all the local pieces should have degree two, which they do indeed. So here in black are the local pieces of the multivariate spline, and in this other color we have the local pieces of the uh, vector partition function, which are a bit longer, so they take two lines. Then blue with the support of the box plane. Um, yeah, given that this is a, a special semester on Lee theory, I just want to mention uh, that this, these vector partition functions appear in well in Copeland's multiplicity uh, formula. So if we have a root system, then we choose some set of positive roots, and then one has the corresponding vector partition function appears under the name constant partition function, that is not relevant for the rest of the talk. And also, some of these, these splines. The uh, examples that you have shown are a root system. Hmm? And examples that you have shown, in fact, are root, positive uh, roots of root systems. Yes, this is, this is also true. Okay. But yeah, knowing <laughs> about root systems is not. Not rather uh, necessary for understanding the rest of the talk. And yes, yeah, some of these splines also appear in, in synthetic geometry <laughs> under the name Duster Mark Heckman measure. So, in some, some very special case, this, this Duster Mark Heckman measure is equal to a to the shifted box spline defined by positive roots, and then there's also some kind of discrete convolution formula with multiplicity. Line used to work with the measure, but this is also not relevant for the rest of the talk. Uh, this slide, however, is, is very relevant, so let's spend more time here. Uh, okay, so 
and we look at a vector x with components v1 through vd, living in r to the d. And this defines as a, a, a linear form where we just take, let's see, the entries of the vector as coefficients of the variables. And for a sublist, if we have a list of vectors, we can get a homogeneous polynomial, which is just the, the product of the easy vectors, uh, of the linear forms corresponding to each of the individual vectors. And here is an example, so if we have this y equals 1, 0, 1, 2, then we get uh, this homogeneous polynomial p sub y equals s1 plus 1 comes from this vector times s1 plus 2 is 2, which comes from this vector. And some more notation, if p is a polynomial, then we will write p of capital B to denote the differential operator obtained by it. <coughs> replacing each of the variables by a partial differential operator. And p of nabla is a is the same but with a difference operator. And well yeah, we had some thoughts in matrix, but you should know the co circuit is an including minimal subset uh, such that the complement doesn't have full ring. And this allows us to define the uh, continuous B space as the space uh, <coughs> containing all polynomials uh, that satisfy these differential equations <coughs> coming from the co-surface. So, should be an example. So, this is our we have this list of vectors which comes the positive roots, as uh, Luca pointed out, then a co-circuit would, for example, be these two, consists of these two vectors, and then we would have a zero and two more differential equations of this type, and then we can find out this is the vector space spanned by the constant and the linear polynomials. <coughs> and uh, yeah, then one can do the same thing with the difference equations. <coughs> and in this case, the solution set will always be a quasi-polynomial and these spaces are called continuous and discrete Diamond and Shelley spaces. And the reason why we have introduced these spaces is that the local pieces of the splines lie in continuous P space, and the local pieces of the uh, vector partition function lies in the uh, discrete P space. <coughs> and uh, in fact, they, the local pieces of these splines and their partial derivatives. Uh, span this as a vector space. And then at some point uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, people wanted to uh, <coughs> gener uh, calculate the dimensions of these spaces. Uh, and uh, then for them, it was very helpful to introduce <coughs> this space, which will turn out to be dual to these. <coughs> so this is the central P space, which is generated by, well, spanned by all the homogeneous polynomials P sub Y, where Y is a sublist of this X, such that the complement still has full rank. So here we would be able to take the, the, the empty list, which gives us the one, a one element list, which gives us the S, and the two element list, which gives us the S squared. And Okay, the next thing one can do is define <coughs> in a pairing. Someone could actually say, well, this, this lives in the symmetric algebra over this dual space uh, <coughs> from like, the, the space which contains the uh, down the Shelley space. And then, uh, yeah, we have to do, can define this pairing here so by just, we take two polynomials and we turn the first one into a differential operator. <coughs> 
let it act on the second one and take the, the constant part of whatever remains. And under this pairing, P and D are dual spaces. And yeah, then later on it will be useful to have this so called <coughs> internal P space, which is a subspace of the central P space, and one can define this as the intersection of all the central spaces uh, where we remove one element from our list, or in the case of these people have defined them as the, the inverse system of some power angle. So this is another way of defining all the key spaces. So we have an example of the key space. <coughs> it's contained what one S and S squared. <coughs> well, here we, we have to remove one element, and then uh, we can just kind of take one or not. And the internal C space. Okay. <coughs> then, yeah, <coughs> time for a new topic. Some geometric definitions. So, I guess everyone here should know what a hyperplane arrangement is uh, <coughs> for each vector. We just take the uh, Set of all vectors that are perpendicular to it, and then the set of all these hyperplanes is the hyperplane arrangement. So <coughs> I only look at the central hyperplane arrangement in this talk. And of course, there are some, there is the Tat polynomial which captures a lot of information about the, the central hyperplane arrangement. <coughs> in particular, Soslavsky shows that the number of connected components of the uh, complement of a hyperplane arrangement is an evaluation of the tap polynomial or <coughs> of the characteristic polynomial and oh, here is the example so here is the tap polynomial <coughs> and we see there are one two three four five six regions and this is also the evaluation of the tap polynomial at two zero <coughs> Um, yeah, so hyperplane arrangements are well understood. <coughs> so now next we will look at the arrangements on the torus. So for, let me recall, I will only consider the, <coughs> the compact torus, which is the d-dimensional compact torus, is the Cartesian product of d one-dimensional spheres. <coughs> and this is, of course, isomorphic to the flat torus. <coughs> which is nicer for drawing pictures. Um, <coughs> yeah, let me remind you of the definition of a character. <coughs> so if we have a vector V with components V1 through Vd, which are all integers, is defined as the character of the torus, which is a map from the torus to the one-dimensional sphere, where we just take each of the, the elements it raises it to the power of D. Okay. <coughs> and yeah, of course, then uh, each vector in the lattice defines uh, a hypersurface in the torus as a set of all elements in the torus such that the corresponding character evaluated <coughs> at phi is equal to 1. So I don't know. Zero is our vector, then it says that x1 squared has to be 1. So this means that s1 can be plus or minus 1, and s2 can be just anything. So this vector defines as these two red circles on the torus. <coughs> and on the, on the flat torus, one can just be this kind of dot product and uh, take every single view of that. And then the connection of all these hypersurfaces is called the toric arrangement. And I think uh, next week there will be a talk by, by Emanuela on uh, this topic. 
And the way we can see here in the, the hyperplane case, there was only like one, one vertex, one zero dimensional intersection, and the toric arrangement has uh, lots of vertices, and uh, so the, the, the combinatorics is a bit more, more, more complicated. And uh, yeah, let me remind you of one thing. So this, each point in the torus defines a map uh, from the uh, integer lattice to the S1 sphere. <coughs> We're just evaluating the, uh, so this maps <coughs> a vector from the integer lattice to the character of the evaluated in this point. And uh, yes, we will use it later on, especially where phi will be a uh, vertex of the toric arrangement. And <coughs> yeah, so why are hyperplane arrangement and toric arrangements related to vector partition functions? Here is one answer. We can look at the Laplace transform of the multivariate spline and get this relational function. And you can easily see that uh, it's well defined on the complement of the <coughs> hyperplane arrangement. And then here's the discrete Fourier transform of the vector partition function. <coughs> and this is well defined on the complement of the toric arrangement. arrangement there is a corresponding <coughs> arithmetic cut polynom uh, polynomial and for toric arrangement uh, there's this is arithmetic cut polynomial so this definition is almost the same as the for the normal cut polynomial but we have this multiplicity function here <coughs> and this is defined as follows so for each uh, sublist uh, of the list of vectors x we define a multiplicity, which is, uh, well, here we take the, uh, the subgroup of the integer lattice contained in the vector space spanned by the, the uh, list of vectors, and we divide this by the uh, um, uh, subgroup uh, generated by the list of vectors. <coughs> this will always be a finite number, and I think next week there will be a talk by Alex Fink on arithmetic matroids and uh, <coughs> more general structures. And yeah, here's a theorem uh, by Luca Mochi, which tells us that uh, well, the uh, number of connected components of the complement of our real hyperplane <coughs> arrangement is given by uh, as an evaluation of the arithmetic polynomial. And uh, here it's in our example, so we can have the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, ten, ten, ten <coughs> connected components, and this is also what the arithmetic cut polynomial gives us. Yeah, let me remind you of zonotopes. So, <coughs> zonotope is a Polytope, which is just the uh, image of the uh, unit cube under the linear map uh, defined by our matrix. <laughs> and in the case of our favorite example, this is this polytope, which is, well, very symmetric, as you can see. It has <coughs> lots of nice properties. And you might know this result of Stanley saying that uh, well, the number of integer points in this zonotope, the number of interior lattice points, and the volume of this zonotope are all uh, evaluations of the cut polynomial under the condition that this is the modular. And uh, there's a more recent uh, theorem by Daniel Yamochi, uh, which tells us that we can get rid of this condition modularity if we take the arithmetic coupling of it instead. Okay. And yeah, I guess everyone knows what a Hilbert series is. And yeah, these spaces that we have seen before, <coughs> they, uh, the uh, continuous P-space and the uh, central P-space, they are uh, 
the, the series is also an evaluation of the type polynomial and the internal spaces of the series is an evaluation of the type polynomial. So I think this is more or less the uh, evaluation which gives us the <coughs> h vector of the uh, independent complex of the dual matrix, and this one should more or less give us the h vector of the uh, uh, broken circuit complex of the dual matrix. So these are well known evaluations of the type polynomial. <coughs> and of course, by the results of the previous slide, uh, this is, this is, yeah. The uh, dimension of the central piece of <coughs> this term there should go away. Uh, it's equal to the volume of the zone of load and the uh, dimension of the internal piece space is equal to the number of interior lattice points of the zone of load. And we also have some decomposition here of the discrete uh, down in Shelley space as a uh, direct sum over all vertices of the power arrangement so that we take some local uh, continuous P spaces versus X phi is kind of the sublist of X of all the vectors in X uh, whose uh, character defines in this vertex. Um, yeah, this was the section. Now we can talk about how one can go from the, uh, uh, well, from the uh, volume to the number of <coughs> integer lattice points and uh, discuss this plot operator in more detail. So this is a form of power series in D variables. <coughs> We call that P sub X uh, denote the linear form uh, defined by the vector X, and then we just take the product over all vectors that are X in our list X. And also this, uh, this uh, rational function has an extension in terms of the Bernoulli numbers. Okay. <coughs> Um, yeah, let me remind you of some notation. <coughs> so for a formal power series <coughs> P, again we just write P of capital B to denote the differential operator obtained by replacing all the variables by partial differential operators. <coughs> and then there is this result of Kowalski and Kuklikov, who showed that if the list of vectors is being modular and we take some vector u in our in the lattice and we take kind of a, a local piece, uh, the corresponding local piece uh, of the multivariate spline, <coughs> then we can apply this differential operator to this local piece and get the value of the vector position function at this point. And uh, well, recall that Tx is only piecewise polynomial, so it's not smooth everywhere. So this is why we have to use a local piece. It's just a polynomial. <coughs> so one can actually apply this, this infinite differential operator to this polynomial. Um, yeah. Then uh, <coughs> yeah, there's a more more general theorem of the Cauchy-Cauchy-Vernier. They say if uh, the matrix is unimodular, and again we take some vector in the lattice, and a suitable local piece of the box line uh, the neighborhood of U, then applying this plot operator to this local piece <coughs> gives us this delta function, which is <coughs> one is the origin and vanishes elsewhere. And this uh, implies the Kowalski-Kuklikov formula. If you remember this formula, 
the kind of a fancy pot operator here turns the x into a, the delta function. This is a neutral element for the convolution, so we get i of x. And uh, yeah, there are various things that I don't like about this theorem. So a uh, the splines they only have like <coughs> they have finite degree n minus e, and the tot operator has infinitely many terms. So obviously, most of them are irrelevant, and one can one can throw away most of them. And uh, of course, one idea would be just to. Uh, Slice off the part <coughs> of the degree larger than n minus b, <coughs> but one can actually, you know, slice off a bit more, and uh, namely one can just take the part uh, of the tot operator which lives in the in the p space. <coughs> so there's some kind of there is some some ideal generated by Kosov which which is complementary to the central p space. And then this projection psi of x just uh, projects to the uh, p component. And what this integration says is kind of uh, gives us a part of the hot operator, which is relevant for what we are doing. So it doesn't matter if we project first or not. We can get the same rate. And. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, the other thing uh, that I don't like about the spot operator is that it's not uh, we apply it to this line, it's not always well defined. And uh, projecting doesn't help. But uh, what one can do, let me remind you, we have this university you know, of the central key space, and then we have this internal key space, which is the subspace. <coughs> And then one can show that if one takes the differential operator, which is in the internal space, it was in the central space, this uh, leaves this line continuous if and only if it's contained in the internal space. Okay. Um, So yeah, let us, let us define a little new operator. So we take this tot operator, we shift it by some exponential, and then we project. This exponential depends on the <coughs> vector z, and then we call this, this polynomial that we obtain f sub z. And well, here's the theorem. If we start with a unimodular list of vectors, we take an interior lattice point in the zonotope, then this f sub z will actually lie in the internal space. By the theorem on the previous slide, this means that the operate, differential operator <coughs> coming from this element uh, leaves the multivariate spline continuous. And then we get this variant of kovansky puchnikov so what is different? We don't have to take a local piece because this operator leaves this line continuous. And we get this shift, uh, which comes from the exponential. So this, is, this shift comes in through, <coughs> essentially, through Taylor extension. <coughs> and one can also uh, show that if we run over all the two relapse points of the zero token, this is putting on this F sub that form a basis for the internal space. So, um, in what sense is the variant of the Kovalsky Kulikov there? Well, it tells us if we have a unimodular matrix, uh, then we can, how can we turn the okay. Uh, Tx into <coughs> Ix in the view. Uh, yes. uh, okay. yeah. So it just looks, we apply some kind of tot like operator to okay. Tx. And so you, you have the uh, replaced the tot operator, but it's a kind of a shorter. Uh, shorter shifted thing, yes. 
Okay. And the, the local piece can be just the function itself. Um, yeah, so this was the uh, modular case, and then the obvious question is uh, <coughs> can you do the general case? And the answer is yes, it's possible. And uh, well, the things become <laughs> a bit more complicated, and you have to some over vertices of the torque arrangement a lot. <coughs> so here we take this periodic top operator, which is well a sum over the vertices of the torque arrangement. Then we get this function from the lattice to the uh, <coughs> S1 defined by the vertex. And here we take some uh, rational function which looks a little bit like the one in the definition of the call operator, except that we have this, this additional term here. And uh, yeah, Bouillon and Werner show that this is exactly the, the operator they need to get rid of the unimodularity condition. So this theorem is exactly Kowalski Publico, except uh, that we have this more difficult operator here, <coughs> and uh, we don't have to assume the modularity. But again, we take a local piece of the multivariate spline to the normal piece by this operator and get the electropetition function. Okay. Um, yeah, then again, I want to. Uh, this operator is too long, and I want to project it to kind of the uh, uh, shorter, the, the relevant part. And this is where this central periodic P space comes in, which is a uh, direct sum over the vertices of the uh, torque arrangement. And then here we have some <laughs> local P space which again is like <coughs> the kind of <coughs> the list of vectors uh, that the, the, the vectors uh, with character defined with vertex. And then we multiply by some polynomial and some uh, periodic function which well, gives us uh, uh, an element of the one sphere for each uh, lattice point. And again, one can define a projection map from this space in which this periodic top operator lives to the central P space and central periodic P space such that uh, this uh, projects kind of to the relevant part of the original operator and the <coughs> projection act in the same way on the uh, multivariate spline. And uh, Again, we can uh, define these uh, <coughs> polynomials as the family of So this is that as the, uh, we take this periodic top operator, shift it a little bit, and then project to the central P space. And there's also an internal periodic P space, <coughs> which is spanned by all the F fertility depths where that lies in the interior of the zonotone. Okay. Um, <coughs> then as before, we have a theorem if the space, <coughs> if a polynomial lies in the central periodic space, <coughs> And it leaves, well, it leaves, and it leaves the uh, uh, spline continuous if and only if it's contained in the internal space. And uh, then, as before, we have this variant of the uh, Brillant Bernier formula, where we take one of these F till that shifted uh, operators coming from an interior left point in the zonotope 
and we apply it to the multivariate spline and get a shifted version of the spectral partition function. And yes, you might remember that we had some <coughs> the previous uh, functions. <coughs> well, the the continuous uh, d space and the normal p space. The Hilbert series were evaluations of the classical hub polynomial, and now in this case, the uh, Hilbert series of this internal space is an evaluation of the uh, arithmetic hub polynomial at like, like exactly the same <coughs> points. And the Hilbert series of the central space is also an evaluation of the arithmetic hub polynomial at the same point for we have to evaluate the normal pathway in order to get the theories of uh, the normal central P space. And then uh, if you compare with the formula a few slides ago, then one of the this last line is a corollary for the dimension of the central P space is equal to the volume of the uh, Zonotope and the dimension of the internal P space, the real P space, is equal to the number of interior flat points of the zonotope. So we could say that the Hilbert series of the internal space is a Q analog of the space of interior flat points in the language of this, the talk this morning. <coughs> and uh, what else? <coughs> oh yeah, we have this the duality between the central p-space and the continuous d-space. And now there's also a duality between the uh, periodic p-space and the uh, uh, discrete p-space. So we kind of define <coughs> a pairing element in here as a kind of a sum <coughs> of some polynomials uh, with some, some extra factor over the vertices of the torque arrangement and an element of the Damon Michelli space, discrete Damon Michelli space, and also some, some polynomials with some factor. And uh, then one can just uh, define this pairing as a sum over the vertices of the toric arrangement. Uh, and then we uh, take this classical pairing because if we had a while ago, and then we obtain that these two spaces are dual and uh, well, one, one reason why one is interested in like, these spaces and uh, the dual is that uh, the Contini Pratesi and Vermeer and uh, recently Cavazzani and Mochi have shown that <coughs> these uh, Dalman and Shelley spaces, both discrete and continuous, uh, and uh, also some, some dual spaces, which were well, slightly different from mine, <coughs> but nevertheless, they can be. Uh, uh, realized geometrically as K theory or cohomology of certain differentiable manifolds. So this one here has something to do with K theory, this one has to do with cohomology. So the space uh, P field is the same space uh, that the test started. Uh, it's, uh... Well, it's kind of you, you look at this uh, quotient mm -hmm. and there is uh, a canonical isomorphism. So well, your you, your space is an algebra, which is a quotient of an ideal, and uh, <coughs> my space is only a, a graded vector space. But there's no, <coughs> it's it's not a quotient. It's an, it's an honest vector space. So okay. I guess depending on what you want to do, <coughs> one of them is better. And uh, yeah, I guess we are approaching the end of the talk. So some more applications. And, uh, <coughs> so they continue producing and Vermeer studied all these splines and <coughs> vector partition functions <coughs> in the paper where they wanted to calculate the, the index of some elliptic operators. And uh, Khovansky and Puklikov uh, were interested in the uh, hilson puklikov mein Roch theorem for smooth projective toric varieties. And then one can translate all these quantities of volume of 
of the polytope and number of left points in the polytope. Um, yes? I seem to recall from the late 90s that there was a paper by Capel and Shamison where they uh, analyze the number of lattice points inside the polytope by applying index theory to uh, toric varieties. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know about this. <laughs> so, from the late mid 90s, I suppose, or at some point, where it seems to be exactly what I'm seeing on the board. Yeah, yeah. well, I think this, is, this is all well sure. known. So. But I'm more more interested in the, the combinatorial itself. So. And yeah, the first thing, of course, like <coughs> in a lot of general reality lattice point the counting is uh, relevant in, in all kinds of areas of mathematics. Uh, and uh, lines and box lines are used in you know, approximation theory and directly analysis. And uh, that's the end of my talk. <coughs> hey, thank you, Matthias, for this talk.